wish I had one or two witnesses. This is, if I have to sing it by myself, my, 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 my song, oh Lord, I'm just praising my Savior. I'm just praising my Savior. I'm just praising my Savior. Oh, the day long. His mercy. Holy Chapel service will start in. He's worthy to be praised. I want you to prepare to go with me to the Gospel of St. Luke, very familiar chapter. that I would like to rehearse into your ears once again. And chapter number 18 of the Gospel of Luke. When you found that place, please give indication by just saying amen. Eighteen, beginning at the 18th verse, continuing through the 23rd verse, I want you to pay particular attention to this reference. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Yes, Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, and that's God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. I want to talk from this thought and subject matter today, moral inequities, moral inequities. I know that you've heard and you're familiar with this passage. Some of you read it, no doubt, hundreds of times. and probably even preached it yourself a time or two. Um, but the good thing about the word of God is that it's alive. Uh, in other words, it's not 
static, is, is, is alive, is always expressing itself. And, and so you can look at one scripture and see multiple dimensions of truth. And this morning, I just want to take a moment and give you a different perspective on an old ritual, moral inequities. There are two operative words here that I would offer you, first of all, for your consideration. And one is the word moral, and the other is the word equity. Rarely do you see those two terms used in contrast with one another. In order to live a centered and well-balanced life, one must be able to give reasonable expression to uh, these character-building traits. Moral um, helps us as we began to anticipate the reality of the word mortality. Relating to our uh, concerned with the principles or rules of right conduct or the distinction between right and wrong, which is also an ethical matter as well. You can have good morals and bad ethics and you still be lost. Morals has to do with the attitude in which we uh, live our lives. And we're living in a time now to where we are blame placing. Everybody's trying to name someone else as being the reason for the problems. Morality. A conformity of the rules or right conducts. Moral is a virtuous conduct, but one must know that we are not all of the same moral fiber. The problem that we have in adjusting to personalities and characters is that we assume that we share the same moral precepts. Are you with me so far? Uh, when morals are just a uh, ruling principle, a uh, thought pattern of conforming conduct, which is usually established and consistent with principles of personal and our social ethics. Let me be clear. Morality is when you give yourself to a set of principles by which you would like to conform your life. Now, let's be real. Everybody don't believe what you believe. And we're quick sometimes to want to judge other folk by saying you're immoral. But they can't be immoral if they don't believe what you believe. They may not be like you. They may not be saved either. But the idea is that we are frustrated by complexity of uh, moral disconnections. We assume that because we believe, others believe it as well. Uh, then we have to deal with the whole idea of immorality. We'll ask another handle we like to give folk. They're immoral. 
Well, you can't determine whether or not they're immoral unless you know what their standard of principle for morality is. And any time they declare what it is and go deviant to that concern, then they are immoral. Y'all will come with me after a while. And so therefore, you got folk that are saying one thing and doing another thing. You're only immoral in the practice of your faith when you express one thing and do another. You may not believe this, but Satan does not possess the same code of ethic and moral standards that you possess. You might say it's a shame and Thus it is according to your standard of living, and so it shall be according to the standard of God, which is our precept for living. But isn't it ironic how we pick our time to practice our faith when Satan practiced his 24-7? Come on, help me, somebody. Not only are we charging him with immorality when he is only immoral if he was to accept the code of moral ethic that has been provided by God himself. But because he does not accept God's word, God would have no dealing with him. The scripture says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because he comes down full of fury because he knows that he only has a short time. Well, so there are differing opinion with regards to moral presuppositioning and I need you to understand that some have no code of ethic at all. Some can get by, if you will, for a moment, uh, expressing not morality at all, but a position of amoral. Being an amoral individual means that you'll do anything, anytime, anywhere, and you don't have a code of ethics. Problem with the world today is that we got folk that's trying to lead us who don't have a code of ethics. Come on, talk to me. Or do anything, say anything, and expect for you to believe the lie. We're living in a day where I can hardly express how corrupt things have become, even in the span of our lifetime. Grandmother used to say, they're lie looking at you. I heard the president a few days ago posture himself by saying, you can't believe what you see. Don't believe what you hear. Can I get a witness? Well, maybe you can't believe all that you see, but you need to know that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. You may not like it, but if God said it, it's settled. Can I get a witness? Folk want to look at us with a John desire because they remember how we used to be. And because we are laden with the pressure of this uh, blatant mortality that uh, some evidence of our former person still exists. My code of ethic is to love everybody. Because God said love everybody. But the truth be known, some folk are just hard to love than others. Do I have a witness? It does not give me, it does not give me a pass on loving you. 
But it means that I need to uh, succumb to the will of God in prayer. And that through faith, my weakness might be overcome with his grace and strength. Yes, we're living in difficult times. We're living in times that we don't realize that uh, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Can I get a witness? And that's one reason how uh, the sitting president has been able to fool so many people. When you become a professional liar, you lie so often until even you believe it. Y'all going to help me? And, 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 and he lies so much until all codes of ethics now are null and void. Lies so much until he allowed over 70 million people to go to the poll and to vote. I wish I had a praying church. Simply suggesting that even before it occurred, the polls were rigged. You know, I had, I had a, I had a, I had an employee once that and I ain't, don't ask me who, but I had an employee once that worked for us here and uh, who um, got in trouble because uh, they called up one day and said that I won't be in on the 25th because I got an emergency. <laughs> Y'all will get that after a while. Some, something's wrong with you having an emergency on a day that has not occurred. Are you listening? And so we must begin to restructure our lives that we might be able to live in conformity with the will of God, even though the task is so daunting that we cannot do it without his help. We look now uh, to an amoral person not involved in questions of right or wrong. Without moral quality, neither with moral or immorality, having no moral standards, restraints, or principles unaware of what might be indifferent or even right or wrong. They just around here. Can I get a witness? Well, I need you to take this stat, these particular stats, and I want you to lay it on top of the scripture. And let's see if we can analyze the same by reason of due process. In this 18th chapter, Luke records that a certain ruler Asked Jesus, saying, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? None is good save one, and that is God. Now let me stop here, because I need you to see something. Even in verse number 18, he doesn't call the individual by name, but he does know who he is because he said it was a certain ruler. Came to him and asked him, saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now look at that verse closely because... First, he comes to Jesus and he recognizes him as being favored by God. And then he asks him, what shall I do? 
And the word is inherit. Which means that whoever he is, he thought he was in the family. Oh, Y'all missed that all together, didn't you? You don't inherit stuff as a rule from people that you have no real relationship with. And so he considered himself favored by God under the principle of his Jewish faith. And so he decided that he would go to Jesus and ask Jesus, what must I do to inherit? Mm, you see, uh, all of my substances, little as they may be, already given to the family. They know what's going on, but now my neighbor's child has to fend for himself. Uh, are you listening to me? My kids come to my house and walk right in and go straight to the kitchen and open up the refrigerator. My neighbor's kids can't do that. Are you with me? So the idea that this person had uh, the nerve to believe that he had something coming to him means that he considered himself as being in the family of God. And I want to know how I can apply for it. I, I, how, how, what do I need to do that I can inherit eternal life? Well, because he was Jewish, Jesus went on to ask him a couple of things. He wanted to establish whether or not he knew who he was talking to. Why are you calling me good? Because as a Jew, you should know that uh, there's only one that is good, and that's God. And then he said, further, being who you are, you, you, you know the commandments. Why are you asking me something like that? You, you know what the Bible says. It says, do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Honor thy father and mother. And he had the audacity to tell Jesus, well, I've been doing all that. I, 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 that I've been doing since the days of my youth. And Jesus said unto him, uh, but yet you're lacking something. You're lacking one vital thing. Uh, you need to sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Now that disturbed him because when you jump down to verse 23, you'll find out he was sorrowful because he was rich. And because he was rich, he went to Jesus and thought he might be able to cut a deal with him. I wish I had a witness. You, you, you know, you got some nerve when you think you can cut a deal with Jesus. Because he's already told you, oh Lord help me, uh, what the deal is. The price is right. C come on, help me somebody. All you got to do is love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And what you're asking for is already done. Mm. He asked him, he says, uh, you, you're lacking one thing. I, 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 want you to, I want you to sell what you have. Now, it would be different because this young man obviously thought that what Jesus was trying to do, he was trying to bankrupt him. You know, you, whatever you do, you can't take my money. But let me just remind uh, all of us today uh, that uh, you brought nothing into this world. Anybody praying with me? 
We forget about that as we're on our journey, but you didn't bring nothing here, and you won't be taking nothing away from here. The house you live in, somebody will live in it. Come on, help me. And the cars you drive, even the money in your bank, somebody else is going to enjoy it one day. Why? Because it was here when you got here. And it will be here when you leave here. That's just a principle of our knowledge of God and faith. So Jesus wasn't trying to bankrupt him. First of all, he said, I want you to sell what you have. Because if you're selling something, it's going to provide an income. Now, this brings us to the word equity. Equity means that whatever you have is destined to increase in value. I use the term in our subject matter, inequity. And because when it comes to the state of moral realities today, we are not getting richer. We're getting poor. Stock market is going down on our ethical presuppositioning. Uh, we don't live like we used to live. We don't think like we used to think. We don't honor God like we used to honor God, but we want to live a long time. He said, sell what you got. And then when you sell it, I want you to give it to the poor. Because after all, you, 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 you're bartering now for eternal life. And so let me tell you what kind of deal I'm really willing to cut with you. If you sell what you have and give it to the poor and the destitute, he said, then I'm going to give you treasures in heaven. Oh, heaven. You know, there was a dying thief that was on one side of Jesus and said, when you get into your kingdom, I want you to remember me. Do I have a witness? Jesus looked at that dying man and said unto him, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. In heaven, where there's no sickness. In heaven, where moths cannot corrupt. Where thieves cannot break in. If you're willing to sell what you have and give it away here, I'll take what you got in equity and I'll deposit it over there. And when you get over there, nobody can take it from you. I remember in the old days we used to talk about we'll never grow old. Can I get a witness? And I'm just old school anyhow, and I don't care. You may not like it, but that's where I found him, and that's where I'll be. <laughs> Come on, help me, somebody. Uh, nothing wrong with old school. If there wasn't an old school, there'd never be a new school. Can I get a witness? We used to raise our voices and say, there is a land where we shall never grow old. Jesus just said, what I'm going to do, if you sell what you have and give it to the poor, then I'm going to write you a receipt and transfer what you have to a place where you won't grow old, to a place where you never will leave it. Or go, oh, help me, somebody. Therefore, I stop by to remind somebody that we need to tighten up our game. And make certain that we realize from whence cometh our help. I don't know about you, but I want the record to show that my help doesn't come from 45. Come on, help me, somebody. My help doesn't come from the Senate. It doesn't come from the Congress. My help, our Lord help me, my, my help comes from the Lord uh, who created 
the heavens and the earth. Can I get a witness here? Oh, you may not believe it, but the Bible said that before there was a when or where, he stepped out into the midst of nothing and said, let there be, and everything began to appear according to the word of God. Yes, yes, my philosophy is not my philosophy. My philosophy is God's philosophy. I learned that whatever God is doing, you need to learn how to agree with him because he's too wise to make a mistake. My philosophy is trying to live a life so that God can use me. Do I have a witness here? You see, we used to sing songs that will pierce even your moral presupposition and get right to the spiritual bone of things and tell you that you need to live so God can use you anywhere and any time. Oh yes, I want you to know that we come from a remnant of people who have faith. Uh, people that realizes that whatever God takes from you, he's prepared to give you more than what you had. We come from a group of people that says that he may not show up when you want him to, but he'll always be on time. Do I have a witness? We come from a group of people that left a great inheritance on a hill. Lord, help me today, Jesus. But they tell me that on a hill in Jerusalem where the temple stood, the Lord allowed those to come in and invade the ranks of their well-being because they had lived so high until they forgot where the help come from. But even so, they went into captivity and the Bible says that there were three young men who were renamed under the authority of Babylon, Babylon rule, Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego. I don't mean any harm, but the Bible said that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had put out a decree that I got the God that you ought to be serving. I don't mean any harm, but his God is not like my God. His God had eyes, but he couldn't see. His God had ears, but he couldn't hear. His God had legs, but he couldn't walk. I wish I had a witness in the house. But he ordered a decree and said, when you hear the music sound, I want everybody in the providence to bow down and worship my God. Well, I need somebody to know that for you to realize that it was God who brought you this far along your way. You should worship him and not another. Do I have a witness in the house? Well, you know, it was God that reached down through the midst of your personal disparity. Ushered you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You ought to be worshiping him. When you realize that it was God that in the time of pandemic crisis, Lord, help me, he allowed some that had hearts of God to put a little meal in the barrel, put it in a box, put a few staples together. Just because God said the poor be with you always, he said you need to help somebody as you travel along this way. Do I have a witness here? Well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down. The word got back to the king that they wouldn't bow. And I don't mean any harm, but there are some folk that get angry when you don't do what they say. I got somebody in mind now that's trying to uh, coach the electors to turn over decisions that have already been made. Do I have a witness here? I see them going out trying to confuse the masses. Uh, trying to make people think that if you don't do it my way, it's the highway. 
But oh, I stopped by to remind somebody today that God is still real. He still sit high and he's still looking low. Are you going to pray with me? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, uh, we won't bow down. And in these times of pandemic crisis, I need one or two believers in the house that refuse to bow down to idle thinking. Do I have a witness? The Lord has been bread on a hungry table. God has been a doctor in our sick rooms. The Lord has been lawyers in our courtrooms. And he promised never to leave us alone. Do I have one or two witnesses in the house? I need somebody that know who the Lord really is. I heard Nebuchadnezzar said, well, if you won't bow down and worship my God, I'm going to turn up this fire hotter than it ever been before. Do I have a witness? And I heard the king look upon the face of three Hebrew boys uh, that refused to relinquish uh, their faith in God. Uh, excuse me, king. Uh, one thing I know uh, is that if our God don't save us, let the record show uh, he is an able God. Do I have a witness? Yes, I stand by to remind you, don't throw out the baby with the bath water. Is that right? Concerning moral concerns, God gets sweeter every day. Is that right? He's better today than he was yesterday. And he'll be better tomorrow than he is right now. I heard one of the Hebrew boys said, if he doesn't save us, let the record show that he's still able to. Is that all right? And I heard that they took Matt, they took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and took them to the fire furnace. Turn it up seven times hotter than it had ever been before. Is that right? So much so until those that took them there was consumed by the heat along. Is that right? Over in the midnight hour, Shadrach Meshach was in the burning flames and early. the next morning the king got up. Do I have a witness? Every now and then your adversary will look at you and see the damage that was done. The next morning they went to the furnace and the king looked in. Is that right? He saw, Lord help me, not one, not two, not three individuals, but he saw four. Is that right? And I heard, I tell you, I heard the king said, Greg on. Not I put uh, in three people, uh, but lo, I see four. Uh, and uh, the fourth one uh, looks like the Son of God. Uh, is that all right? Uh, if God uh, doesn't get you out of a situation, uh, who will uh, get in it with you? Uh, is that all right? Uh, and I'm glad today uh, that early uh, one Sunday morning, uh, after a torturous uh, Thursday evening and uh, a brutal, uh, a brutal uh, Friday afternoon, uh, I heard uh, early Sunday morning uh, he got up 
with all power, even in his hand, is mine. I'm here to tell somebody, can't nobody do you quite like him. He's been a friend that'll stick closer than a brother. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the God I serve gets sweeter every day. Is that all right? That is a living testimony that he will bring you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Do I have a witness every night?